Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. You know, Sink Estates are the UK equivalent to American ghettos. Council estates with high levels of economic disadvantage and often blighted by high crime rates. But there's a new sort of sink estate in the UK, and it's not in Peckham, Harlesden, or Gospel Oak. No, this sink estate is right here in the city of London. This moral sink estate is also nurtured by the government dole. But rather than locking in high levels of economic disadvantage, this sink estate is plagued by intergenerational economic advantage. And instead of being impossible for the residents to succeed, it is impossible for the residents of this banking sink estate to fail. And whereas the sink estates for the poor are nearly impossible to escape, this banker sink estate is almost impossible to enter. But unlike the impoverished sink estate, the enriched moral sink estate is always a no-go area of high crime where your pockets will definitely be picked, your savings mugged, and your pension stolen. Oh, Stacy, when are we going? <laughs> We're here. This is the city of London, the moral sink estate, right here outside this office. Well, of course, you know, these sort of high crime rate areas, they often have one gangster thug who runs it all, and the gangster thug of the moral sink estate that is our banking establishment. Now we know J.P. Morgan Chase is worse than Enron. It's beginning to look as if J.P. Morgan Chase has had a hand in every major banking scandal of the last decade. In fact, it's the zealot of Wall Street crime. Take a snapshot of any major bank fraud and chances are you'll see J.P. Morgan Chase staring out at you from the frame. So J.P. Morgan Chase, of course, this is in response to their latest revelations that they've basically signed a um, non-prosecution agreement and paid a fine of about $2 billion for their role and looking the other way from the Madoff scandal, the Madoff fraud. Right, well, Enron, which was a huge accounting scandal en enabled by Arthur Anderson, who was their accountant at the time, they were parking 80 to $90 billion off their balance sheet until such time as the Ponzi scheme that was Enron blew up and the stock went to zero and Jeff Skilling and others went to jail, and I believe Jeff Skilling is going to be let out of jail early because as part of the corruption that we're talking about, the uh, judicial system is corrupted by these bankers as well. Now, flash forward to J.P. Morgan. What do they have off their balance sheet on these special purpose entity accounts? Not 80 billion, but 90 trillion. Mm -hmm. 90 trillion in derivatives. They have more off the balance sheet in derivatives than the entire GDP of planet Earth. They keep it afloat with artificially low interest rates thanks to the corruption of Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve Bank, and central banks around the world, and accounting fraud. Not Arthur Anderson, because they've already been put out of business, but the big four that are left, the two big to four accounting firms are enabling Jamie Dimon's off-balance sheet and run-like scandal. Now, of course, with Enron, famously, when the audio clips were played of their phone conversations, they were making fun of ripping off Granny in California. Well, the same thing here is not only did they use that same exact, did J.P. Morgan use that same exact Enron scandal and fraud, but they say, foreclosure fraud, investor fraud, cheating customers, market manipulation, LIBOR, and now the coup de grace to J.P. Morgan's tattered reputation, a $2 billion fine for closing its eyes and covering up as Bernie Madoff literally built widows and orphans along with a lot of other families and charities. Now, comparing this to the sink estates, of course, it's very difficult for old people, old ladies to walk across the estate safely. Here, it's difficult for old ladies with pensions to walk across the city of London because the bankers will likely steal their pensions. Right, in an intergenerational basis. In other words, the only way to pay for the fraud is by bilking and looting the current generation and future generations to pay off the bonuses and the legal fees of the fraudsters and the crooks in the present day. Now, when the sink estates, the crime rates there, often what you find is the, the local police either just give up um, you know, policing the area because it's too dangerous, or they're in the pocket of the local thug. Here we see Department of Finance cannot locate banking crisis files. This is from Ireland, where we know the entire system collapsed based on one bank, one commercial bank, not a high street bank. Well, documents relating to the banking crisis have gone missing at the Department of Finance. The department has conceded that some correspondence forwarded from Bank of Ireland to former Minister for Finance Brian Lenihan can no longer 
be located. So this is based on freedom of information requests. They did send eight pages to this uh, journalist who asked for it, entirely redacted. Not one single thing able to be seen. Right. Well, leading up to the crisis on this show, we said Brian Lenaheim is involved in fraud and others. Of course, RTE, the state broadcaster in Ireland, refused to cover the story because they're also in the pocket of the banksters and the fraudsters. And now when it comes to the point where now that we know that there's fraud, it's unequivocally true that they committed fraud, then they say, oh, well, we lost all the, uh, all the evidence. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's the important thing. The, the crooks, the criminals, the thugs, the guys in Wandsworth Prison, the guys in Belmarsh, they commit crimes. That's what they do. But if you have a system where the justice and the, the finance minister and the regulators and the, the people policing them are helping to cover up their crimes, this is a different situation. This is active participation in denying justice ever be done. And therefore, the moral sink sinks lower and lower until we have wide-scale corruption across the entire system. What you're talking about is a racket. Yes. So in other words, the judicial system in Ireland, along with the accounting firms, the bankers, and the politicians, and the fund managers, and, the, and guys like an Anglo-Irish bank are part of a criminal racket, a criminal enterprise which has no hope of being prosecuted because there's no element in Irish society today. There's nobody in the institutional uh, part of the Ireland, Irish culture, whether it's the legal system, the political system, the media, that's not part of this corrupt racket of fraud. It's the, the bankster sink estate and it's worldwide it's going global you know just like in in los angeles you have the crips and the bloods you started there now they're all the way down in the you know central america all over the world they're spreading their their racket that has spread but let me let me put this into context and explain again what we've explained on this show before we've seen the corruption of the leverage buyout in america going back to the R.J. Reynolds takeover and the works of Henry Kravis and other private equity firms that take over $100 billion companies using leverage that is ill-gotten through fraud. When they ran out of companies to take control in this way in America, they started going after small countries. Greece and Ireland, being $200 billion economies at the time, were, were small enough, essentially, for fraudsters in America in the city of London to do a leverage buyout, take over the country, and now they're selling the assets to pay off the debt uh, in exchange for multi-hundred million and billion, multi-billion dollar fees, which is why the rich list last year saw the top one-tenth of one percent increase their wealth by hundreds of billions and actually over a trillion dollars because of the leverage buyout of Greece, the stripping of the assets and the stolen uh, property, the leverage buyout of Ireland, the leverage buyout of Portugal. They're trying to do the same thing in Spain. They're trying to do the same thing in France. Well, leverage buyout, I think, however, is kind of a fancy word for just stolen. They took it. They took it for no, th there wasn't even any fee paid, no money paid, no, no exchange of, of goods and services. Well, what, what, what is a leverage buyout? I mean, just to be, give you a, a, you know, a potted a quick explanation is you're pledging the assets of the country, or in this case the country, to finance the loan to take over the country. Okay, the IMF had no money. The IMF has no money, and neither do the people who have taken over Ireland. They had no money to begin with, but they pledged the assets of Ireland to get the loan to take over the country. Now they're selling off the state assets and the state income-producing assets to pay back the loan against that they use as collateral to take the, the, the original takeover to begin with. Yes, but how did that moment arrive? How did the moment arrive where they could use the assets of the nation to, to fraud it? Well, just like in a sink estate, what happens in the sink estate? They give for free to the young people heroin or crack. Here, try this for free. Well, this is how the, the city sink estate works. They hook you up in cheap debt or cheap swaps to protect you. We're just here to protect you. This is a protection racket. We're protecting you by selling you hedges that are going to blow up and we're going to steal your country with it. Well, that's definitely part of the comprehensive nature of this fraud is the pushing of debt. But don't remember in Ireland under Bernie Ahern, uh, there, there was a satchel of cash. You confused him with Bernie Madoff. It's Bertie Ahern. <laughs> Bertie Ahern. Remember, it involved a big satchel of cash. <laughs> Remember, that also has come out also. So don't, don't uh, disparage good old-fashioned graft and bribes. They still have a place in this kleptocracy.
Now, as we said at the top of the show, J.P. Morgan's uh, Jamie Dimon is the top of it. He is, was, of course, known as the president's favorite banker. Well, the president's favorite banker, we don't know if he's involved in this story because nobody knows in the United States Congress who has written TPT. TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, U.S. politicians once have fast-tracked the super secret, super controversial TPP. The TPP is already being negotiated behind closed doors, but the situation could get worse. Late on Thursday afternoon, House Ways and Means Chairman Dave Camp, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Max Baucus, and Senator Orrin Hatch introduced the bipartisan Congressional Trade Priorities Act of 2014. The bill would grant the White House fast-tracked authority, sometimes known as the Trade Promotion Authority, to ratify trade deals. So we don't know who wrote this. There's some corporate lobbyists who wrote this. And here we have the situation where both Democrats and Republicans, despite all their shrieking and pretending they're on opposite sides, here they are ready to pass a secret deal giving all sorts of huge authority to the executive branch, to the president, to ratify trade deals that the Congress doesn't, will only have an up or down vote. So they can only vote yes or no to ratify the, 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 the trade deals. All right, so this is to follow along here the latest chapter in the history of leverage buyouts as we were describing it in this in this show so far. In other words, you start off with these huge leverage deals in America, like RJR Nabisco or some of the more famous huge deals. And the players are Henry Kravis of Colbert Kravis Roberts and other big leverage buyout firms. You know, the leverage buyout going back all the way to G Sir Jimmy Goldsmith here in this country, who was really one of the pioneers of the leverage buyout during the 1980s. Thank you, Sir Jimmy. Uh, then you have the leverage buyout of countries like mm. Ireland and Greece, where they've been assets have been stripped. People have had to flee the country looking for jobs in other countries. Now you have a leverage buyout of the global economy. TPP yes. is put together by the same folks who have run out of countries to destroy, essentially. They want, they want to do a leverage buyout of the entire global economy with the assistance of IMF and other global banks, including the World Bank. They hope to do this effective leverage buyout of the entire global economy with TPP, and then as you point out, assets will have to be sold, liquidated, destroyed. Uh, President Obama is the Henry Kravis of presidents. He's just going to start <laughs> signing off on liquidations of assets in America to pay off the debt that was illegally foisted upon uh, the public due to this TPP deal. Anyway, we got to go. Stacey Herbert, we're on our way. Okay, Max. Stay tuned for the second half, a whole lot more. Follow the flame. The Olympic spirit travels with the flame from its birthplace in Greece. Join James Brown for an elemental and epic journey around Russia and beyond. back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Pippa Melgron. Uh, now, Pippa is a financial advisor, DRPM Group, uh, as well as a politics and policy expert who used to be special assistant to the President of the United States for economic policy on the National Economic Council and former member of the U.S. President's Working Group on Financial Markets. Pippa, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thank you. All right. We st we're tweeting on Twitter. Yes. And we were tweeting about shrinkflation, which I think is an important topic, not covered all that well. Mm. Talk about it. 
So I think what we're witnessing is the early stages, the precursor to inflation. And we have a big debate about why that is, but let's just say when governments start printing money, normally you start to get price pressures. Prices start rising. We see record high prices of the stock market for property, but also input costs start going up. And what happens at the beginning is companies are reluctant to charge you more because they know you're, as a citizen, under a debt burden that's, you know, epic. So instead what they do is they make the size of things smaller. So we see this in all sorts of different ways. You know, Cadbury's announced they're making the size of the chocolate bar smaller. They're taking two squares off the end, but they're going to sell it to you at the same price. Or my editor on a book I'm writing says she bought paper towels the other day. They don't fit in the paper towel holder because they're too short. The paper towel just falls out, right? That's shrinkflation. Right, shrinkflation. So you're getting less for the same price. Same price. Which is another way to say it costs more. That is another way to say it costs more. Coke cans, which are three quarters of the width, three quarters of the height, same price as the old days. I think the point is, if you were to weigh ounce per ounce or measure exactly, you would find you are paying more for stuff. But this doesn't show up in the data points for central banks. Right. So, so at the end of the month, they get their food bill and they say, wait, this costs a lot more than it did last month. But the government says that inflation is running at, according to them, 2.8 or 2.2 percent now. Correct. So actually, they say going down. They do not incorporate the fact that the portions are decreasing, correct? Well, I think they don't do a good job of incorporating this. And the point is it's happening very fast. This is a fairly recent phenomenon of the last couple of years only. And, um, but what it tells us is that at some point, you know, for example, the other day there was a story about a potato chip bag. Now there are only 11 potato chips in there. The rest is compressed air because compressed air weighs, right? So they can technically say it still weighs the same amount. But, you know, eventually there are only two in there and then it's a bit of a joke. And then they'll have to actually raise the price. And that is the moment that the central bank models for inflation will start to say, ah, we have inflation. Okay, but the point is you can see it coming. Would, I, would it be uh, wrong to suggest that the scandal of a few months ago, horse meat found in mm. lasagna, is another example of hidden inflation? Uh, you know, I see you nodding your head. Speak it is, bit. indeed, and it's something I raised uh, with my client base. So let's look at two different stories. One, record high prices for beef, very consistently over the last 18 months. That's the one side. On the other side, the price of hay has gone up right? Like a lot of grains, right? So when the price of hay goes up, it becomes more expensive to feed your horses. Suddenly we get a jump in the number of horses that are either being put into care or sent over to the abattoir. Suddenly you've got a lot of meat that isn't easily substitutable and you've got a record high price and a record low one. It doesn't take a genius to put the two together. And let's face it, in some places like France, you know, having horse meat in the lasagna is considered a luxury, right? And the French are like, and what is the problem? But the point is we should be alert to this issue that companies are increasingly under pressure on their margin and the way they're going to try and preserve it is to put in substitutes that cost less. Right. So getting back to the government published numbers, they're higher than what the government is publishing. Um, do you have any idea really what the true numbers are? We know that they're higher than the 2.2 percent that they're stating of yeah. CPI. Uh, any, your firm, you advise clients, you're obviously positioning your portfolio ahead of a breakout in inflation. Mm. What do you tell clients? What is the real number, the whisper number, so to speak? Right. Well, I trust Paul Volcker on this subject, of all people. And he likes the work done former on... Former Fed chairman former of, a, head of, of the America Federal Reserve before and, Greenspan. Exactly. In fact, you know, he's kind of the Bruce Willis of the world economy. He's the guy who fought inflation and won successfully the last time we what saw What does he it. say? So he says we should look at a website called Shadow Government Statistics, which is run by uh, John Williams, who basically calculates the inflation rate the way we used to back in the 1980s, before we made a lot of changes to the methodology. And based on that measure, we're running a lot closer to, say, 8 or 9 percent right now. 8 or 9 percent? Yeah. So it's a big gap. So in, and the wages are going down. Wages are going down. Inflation is real. Inflation is going up. Well, let's say your cost of living is rising. Your standard of living is falling. Wages are complica complicated, I have to say. But I see balance, signs that wages balance. are starting to rise as well, but not enough for the average person. But on balance, we're saying that wages are rising less than 1 percent, even against the the misstated government numbers of 2.2 percent of the inflation rate, that's a huge gap uh, which is contributing to standard of living declining in this country, right? Absolutely. 
And if the actual rate of inflation you face in your real life, as opposed to the data point the government gives you, is substantially higher than that, then the only conclusion is your standard of living is falling. Right, so not only wages are up less than 1%, and the real rate of inflation you're saying is 9%, that's a 7% loss of purchasing power every year going forward. Compound that, you're losing, the, you know, using the rule of 72, you're, every 10 years, you're, you've, you've, you've cut your whole lifestyle in half. Correct. To, to use a rough estimate. So let's understand what is the purpose of the exercise. The reason governments have an ancient history of engaging inflation is because it helps them get out of their debt problem at the expense of the citizens. So this is the point. It's the least obvious way to have the government succeed in reducing the debt. But the fact is it has real human consequences and social consequences. And, you know, we've seen this happen ever since the Roman Empire. I mean, the reason we have, you know, serrated edges on coins these days is so that you know they haven't been shaved off. Today, with electronic money... Because you're referring money, back to the Roman times, the yeah. denarius, where they coin clipped. That's right. So, they just took bits of metal off it all the time. Right, so sh shrinkflation or horse meat, these are, these are coin clipping exercises by essentially a corrupt government who is not honest enough to say, we're going to raise your taxes. Instead, they're going to inflate their debts away, and your standard of living is going to collapse. But you mentioned the central banks there, and I want to focus on this for a second. Yeah. So the Fed and the Bank of England, they're coddling these two big-to-fail banks, really, and that's part of the equation. That's why they won't fess up and say, we need to raise your taxes. They're going to inflate away the debt. Because the banks, uh, that would, uh, if they really were to address this in a substantive way, raise taxes, raise interest rates, the too big to fail banks would start going bankrupt. I am I correct? What do you think? Yeah, I think that, look, it's a, at, the, at the end of the day, it's a balance of interests. And you're right. They can't permit interest rates to go up. Uh, and that's the natural break on inflation. And in fact, interest rates can't go up because governments are now the biggest buyers What do you think about the, the comment from Danny Blanchflower, who's mm -hmm. an economist, well-respected, yeah. somewhat no, respected well. guy, who uh, I try to impress upon him this idea that by keeping rates so low, they're causing the deflation. They're causing um, the stagnation of the economy because they're supporting these zombie banks that are crowding out real economic activity. And he'll say, no, there's no, that's impossible. Lower rates don't cause deflation. Uh, he seems to be trapped in kind of uh, the earlier century of thinking. Maybe I'm being too harsh. What do you think? Uh, well, I think lower rates ultimately will cause inflation. I think that's the bottom line for me. Um, well, Danny Blanchflower's view is that the only way you will get any dynamism back in the economy is if banks engage in lending. I think that what we're witnessing is an incredible transformation. New sources of finance are appearing all the time, from crowdsource financing, which is not just about some entrepreneur with an idea on Kickstarter. These days, you have huge companies that are able to finance their invoicing streams through basically lending from private parties. So my view is lending is happening more and more, and this is crowding out the banks. So now we've got a really terrible situation where government's using effectively taxpayer funds to keep alive institutions that the economy doesn't need as much as they used to. Right, but so the crowdfunding and the innovations in finance will crowd out the banks that are crowding out the economy. Correct. So they will be taken out of the equation. But uh, raising interest rates at this point would actually stimulate bank lending because then they're making money on their loans instead of just going to the central bank and depositing there for no risk and getting a rate of return. I think that's the point, is that yeah. raising rates right now would actually stimulate loan creation. I think Danny completely misses that, but mm -hmm. we've got to move on. You were a member of the President's Working Group on Financial Markets. Some call this the Plunge Protection yeah. Team. <laughs> yes, it was formed did. after the crash of 1987. I was working on Wall Street at the time during the crash of 87. The day after, the week after, the President's Working Group of Finance was created. It was Alan Greenspan, Ronald Reagan, and Robert Rubin. Yes. Treasury Secretary. A lot of people don't even uh, admit that this exists, but not only does it exist, but the mandate has expanded so that the U.S. government effectively is managing markets all over the world with a trillion dollar line of credit. Is this become an out of control monster? What do you think? Well, first of all, having sat on this group, it has no power. It doesn't orchestrate anything. So the idea that it's a plunge protection team doesn't really add up. However, wait, 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 I have that, to cut in there for a second because on, on Tuesday, October 20th, which is the day after the Monday crash, yeah. 
the government went in and bought S and P futures contracts no, no, using borrowed money, leverage credit. That's I an active, you. that's a market manipulation and interference but by the, this group. But you got the group wrong. The point is, the group you're referring to now is a bunch of bureaucrats who are two levels down. But what does matter is when the Secretary of the Treasury and the head of the Federal Reserve and the White House together come to an agreement about how we're all going to proceed, and that does go on. It's just not the plunge protection team. That's a separate group that's evolved into a bureau bureaucratic but the mandate mechanism. Is the same. To, to pick market prices that they're comfortable with and bypass the free market. The mandate is the same. And to bypass is, the free market. Well, this is true. And that's exactly what particularly the Federal Reserve is doing, is choosing what is the price of the bond market that they want. Is that a free market? No. And they're using every possible instrument to hold the bond market within the, quote, acceptable range, which right. means we, we no have longer fake, have free market. We have fake deflation. Because underneath it all is the real inflation that at some point you're saying and you're advising folks they can't keep the lid on this any much longer. Yeah. And then all that money printing and all this fake market manipulation and bond purchases and quantitative easing blows up in their face and you see the prices really take a, a jump at, at well, some point. Well, what I'm saying is the way they're seeking to solve deflation is by creating as much inflation as they can under the assumption that they'll be able to control the outcome. And that's what Paul Volcker says is you can't create just a little inflation and you definitely can't control the outcome. So this is the fundamental question that is over the Federal Reserve right now. They believe we can pick the level of inflation and control it, just like they think they can pick the level of the bond market and control it. And my view is they can't. You can't pick the level and control it. Isn't that supposedly the lesson we learned by watching the failure of the Soviet Union? I'm like, did everybody completely forget about the Soviet Union and that communism and centralized planning so doesn't Mark Hardy work? And <laughs> Janet Yellen are acting as Soviet Union communist era Stalinist dictators and manipulating I think, prices. I think there's a there's a degree <laughs> there's a degree of hubris and arrogance and self belief that somehow policymakers are smarter now or better equipped with information and therefore they can do this better than in the past. You say no. But I say no. All right, we got to go, unfortunately, because we're out of time, but I would love to continue, but we must go. Pippa, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you. That's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report. With me, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert, I'd like to thank our guest, Pippa Malmgren. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.